Welcome to the Market Front Lines. I'm Lindsay Melchak. This is a real shift that's happening right now in decarbonization trade. Investors are no longer rewarding concepts or pilot scale ambition. What they're looking for is infrastructure that is built, that is commissioned, and ready to produce revenue in sectors where emissions are hardest to eliminate and margins are what matters the most. Now, That brings us to a company moving out of the lab and into live industrial operations, a company positioning itself at the intersection of clean energy, advanced materials, and environmental remediation. I'm joined by Andrew White, CEO of Char Technologies. Welcome, Andrew. It's great to have you here. Thanks, Lindsay. Pleasure to be here. Now, Andrew, let's start where this story truly changes. Char has now commercially commissioned its first high-temperature pyrolysis Pyrolysis, I'm saying it wrong, but I think you get it, facility in Thorold. Now, this is a critical shift from development into operations. So what does commissioning actually change for Char in terms of credibility, revenue visibility, and how the market should now be thinking about this company? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question about our high temperature pyrolysis uh, project in Thorold, for sure. Um, so we are moving into commissioning, and really what that means is we're installing and starting to turn on all the equipment. And that means we're shifting from doing pilot scale tests with industrial customers to producing commercial quantities on recurring basis, driving recurring revenue, and really turning it into a real viable cash flow generating uh, business, which uh, is always tough in the clean tech space or the the, uh, the energy transition space because there's a lot of capex. So uh, it's been a it's been a journey, and and we're just so excited uh, to be here at at this point. It's uh, it's awesome. Well, you know, once you cross that line into operations, everything else gets sharper. So the execution risk narrows, the timelines tighten, and partnerships suddenly matter a lot. Now you s- secured some industrial relationships with partners like the BMI Group and others. Um, now those are not symbolic names. So how do you how? Let me rephrase that. How do long-term offtake agreements and infrastructure-aligned partners fundamentally de-risk scale up for char and separate this from the many decarbonization stories that stall before commercialization? Yeah, it's a it's another great question, and and we know we're all about partnerships. So you look at our Thorold project. You know, we're we're treating that as a fifty-fifty joint venture. So that's what the BMI group. But if I if I take a step back and look at our industrial partners and our, our really deployment and delivery partners. Uh, I want to start with ArcelorMittal, uh, the world's second largest steel and mining company. So they have recognized and identified our technology as critical for their decarbonization and steel making around the world. And so they made an investment in us corporately. And then their steel mill uh, just down the highway from Thorold in Hamilton called ArcelorMittal DeFasco is the off taker. So it's really critical on a project basis to see that uh, secure offtake. Where's the product going? Do you have someone who's going to buy it and who's going to going to pay for it? Next, for the site itself is the BMI Group. So the BMI Group also invested corporately and then invested $8 million in the Thorold project directly uh, to become a project partner. And what's really exciting about the BMI Group is their business model is buying sort of old and or or defunct or uh, decommissioning pulp and paper mills. Um, so these are facilities that are in the heart of forestry operations uh, that have been providing a service to the forestry industry and to the community for years. But with the downturn in in pulp and paper industry, the plants are no longer viable. So the BMI group goes in, they refurbish it, and we become you know an anchor tenant in those facilities. So that's Thorold. That's uh, other project sites that they, they're they rolling out. They've got eight or nine pulp and paper mills and, and continue to grow. Uh, so we see a, a huge opportunity there for infrastructure, which allows for rapid deployment of future projects. And then kind of the third one is Lake Nipigon Forest Management Inc. And that's on the feedstock supply side. So Lake Nipigon Forest Management Inc., uh, it's owned by the four First Nation communities that uh, sort of live in and reside in the, the Lake Nipigon area. They manage about a million hectares of forest, which is about one-fifth the size of Nova Scotia, so a pretty, pretty large area. Um, and they become the feedstock suppliers. So when you look at a, a decarbonization project or a project based on biomass, 
it comes down to all of these three elements is where's the where's the biomass where's the feedstock coming from and how secure is it where's the site how do you build it how do you deploy rapidly and who are the customers and so we have strategic partners across that value chain to really bring that risk level down oh my gosh and what's especially interesting here is how localized waste streams are being tied directly into a global industrial demand. Now, Char is building a platform that links northern Ontario fiber and wood waste into energy and advanced material markets at home and abroad. So how scalable is this model across Ontario's forest sector? And further to that, how significant is the opportunity to plug domestic biomass into global industrial decarbonization efforts? Yeah, that's, I think, one of the, the approaches that we've taken, and, and there's a couple of reasons for this approach, but it's really one of modularity. And so that does a couple of things, but on the ability to utilize forest biomass, there's almost, you know, at, at a certain size, you have a, a disincentive for economies of scale because biomass by its nature is distributed. So with a modular type approach, we can have a couple of different projects distributed amongst where that biomass fiber is, you know, securing the fiber, not needing to pull it from too far away, but really, like I was saying, providing a great outlet for this fiber that is really critical for the survival of, of the forestry industry. And I'm not saying, you know, Char is single-handedly saving forestry or anything crazy like that, but the forestry industry needs homes for this material. And this is a great pathway to really, really secure that. And then once we've gone through the high temperature pyrolysis process, we've created our biocarbons for steel making. We've created our renewable natural gas. You know, that those products can be sold globally. So the gas, once it's in the pipeline, you know, can be contracted almost anywhere. Um, the The biocarbon itself, we've taken really light, low density wood chips and created a very dense carbon pellet that can be packaged, can be shipped, can be taken to where decarbonization incentives are are strongest. So the pellets can very easily go to Europe. They can be used here at home in, in Ontario and in Quebec, where we're really, really focused on domestically as well. So uh, really broad applications uh, across the globe. If heavy, hard to abate industries are looking to decarbonize, um, you know, we can we can get product and, and uh, material to them. This is fascinating. Like all of it is just so fascinating. And I want to bring this over, you know, to a different topic here a little bit. And scaling capital intensive infrastructure usually comes with dilution. So I want to go there for a little bit. Char has taken a different approach. You've accessed meaningful non-dilutive government support targeting hard to obtake uh, sectors. So how important is that funding in accelerating deployment while protecting shareholder ownership? And really, what does it signal about your policy and industrial decarbonization priorities that are truly in the, the forefront right now? Yeah, and we've been we've been really fortunate in the government support. And I think from there's a couple angles on that and, and a couple of really important points. One is, you know, that support is there because we've proven a business case and a business model. Um, one that does not rely on government funding, but certainly the non-dilutive government funding is helpful. And really it's to encourage companies like ours and projects like ours to use underutilized material that help with decarbonization, help with job creation uh, in, in some of these communities where, where jobs have been lost due to, you know, shifting, you know, industrial focuses and, and, and markets. So that part's really exciting. But from an overall perspective, uh, overall corporate perspective, you have the non-dilutive funding, which is which is fantastic. But we've really taken a project's focus on further deployment. You know, at some point, government funding is is great. And we we are, like I said, very great. Uh, we have a lot of gratitude for it. It's great that we've received it. Um, at some point, you just you stop getting grants as as you're sort of doing the, the approach that we want, which is the modularity. But by taking a project approach, it means we're funding at the project level. So that means, you know, we've got four projects, you know, two into construction, two that uh, we expect to to move forward very quickly. But we don't need to raise 100% equity to cover all of those projects. You know, we're not going out and doing a $200 million equity raise to build a bunch of projects. We're funding at the project level. We're bringing in non-dilutive funding. We're bringing in project debt, and we're bringing in project equity partners. And so that 
I think balances really well, rapid deployment, uh, while avoiding the the big dilution of trying to fully equity finance um, these projects. So I think that's really important as we as we progress. Is that you know we we need to continue to look at partners and and it's done in such a way that it's it's minimally dilutive to to shareholders. And that's what investors want to hear. <laughs> Absolutely. So beyond energy and materials, there is another dimension here that is gaining urgency very fast. And that's PFAS, the destruction and environmental remediation that's emerging as a complementary growth pathway alongside renewable gas and biocarbon. How does this capability fit into Char's long-term strategy? And could remediation become a meaningful revenue driver as regulation and enforcement continue to tighten? Yeah, and, and on the, the PFAS space, or, or for those who are less familiar with it, polyfluorinated alkyl substances, but just think forever chemicals, that's usually what it's branded in in the media. It's in everything, Teflon, you know, Gore-Tex, uh, anything nonstick or water resistant probably has it or had it. And therefore, it's in a lot of places. So for Char's application on PFAS, it's in, in wastewater. So, you know, because it's in everything, it gets into the wastewater. Um, we've been working in this space almost as long as the, the biomass space. Um, and really what we're doing is taking uh, what are called biosolids. So that's dried sewage sludge that historically has been able to be used as a fertilizer because there is nutrient in it. But with the PFAS, it, it's got to go to the landfill. Um, it's it's got to go to the landfill now until, of course, we put it through a high temperature pyrolysis process. And so from the investor perspective, the thing to really reiterate is it's the same technology. It's this high temperature pyrolysis kiln. It's a, it, it's the exactly the same. We're just putting different stuff in it. So on all the stuff we've talked about, woody biomass to decarbonization, energy products, we're part of the ownership structure of those plants and we will get operating contracts and, and be in for the, the long term. On the biosolid space, it's a very saturated market. Uh, it's a market that deals with local government and municipality. And there's other companies and entities that are much better suited to leverage those relationships. So um, on the PFAS side, it's much more about how do we deliver high temperature pyrolysis projects for PFAS destructions with project partners. Uh, and the first example of that is the system we built uh, with Sinegro in and with the city of Baltimore uh, to demonstrate this technology. So we put the, the plant together, Sinegro is now operating it. And it's showing uh, some initially some great results. Um, we're hoping to be able to publish some of those broader test results uh, in the coming months, but it destroys the PFAS, it creates a biochar. So now the the output can can go back into fertilizer and, and, and soil amendment and that type of application. So destroys the PFAS, keeps the nutrients, creates a biochar. It's it's a it's a great story, but the approach to market is is slightly different in, in taking advantage again of those partnership opportunities. So you can there's there's kind of a theme here maybe that we like partners, we like people who can help us deploy as rapidly as possible where there's strategic alignment and uh, complementary uh, process. Amazing, amazing. So you know we are at the end of 2025. Uh, you know people are now looking at. What's coming next? What's what's 2026 holding? I mean, what should investors be looking for in the next coming quarters? Yeah, I mean, I think 2026 is is a year that we're uh, super excited for here at, at Chartac for sure, um, because the world's coming online, you know, so we start to see commercial biocarbon deliveries out of that project. We start to see that project move towards the renewable natural gas, so the second phase, which uh we're, we're looking to, to get into commissioning by the end of 2026. Um, we expect to see our project with our partners in Lake Nipigon uh, kicking off uh, once the, the snow melts and the mud settles down a bit. So usually that's sometime between May and June uh, when they can start doing doing the construction. But the site's already uh, being cleared by our partners and, and biomass uh, residuals are already being stockpiled there. So that's a really exciting project. Um, you know, we announced a little while ago now some funding from the Quebec government for our St. Felicien project. I think there's, there's going to be more to come there and we can see that project start to progress in 2026 as well. So uh, uh, a couple of additional projects kicking off where we bring the world through commissioning commercialized uh, operation, which is uh, which is really exciting and uh, you know we're, we're looking forward to it. 
Well, I mean, it sounds like 2026 is going to be a fabulous year for you. This has been an insightful conversation. And, you know, it, it really does help us take a look at what it takes to move from climate ambition to operating infrastructure. So thank you for joining us. Come back soon. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. We've been speaking with Andrew White, CEO of Char Technologies, trading on the venture under the symbol YES. Now, Char is not selling a future promise, is building systems that turn waste into value, emissions into opportunity, and regulation into revenue. This is what industrial decarbonization looks like when it leaves the slide deck and enters the real economy. I'm Lindsay Melchick with Abiton Media. This is the Market Frontlines, and we'll see you next time. 